Chris Appleton. Yes, yes. And we're going to discuss the brand new Blaze Bailey album, War Within Me. Yep, yep. Very exciting, guys. Gentlemen. Uh, Alan, you should have sort of coordinated with Chris. Chris Appleton. Hold yeah, on, we, got the same, we're, we got the same tailor. Look at that. That's bizarre. However, I'm the outsider. <laughs> All right, Blaze. Very exciting news. New album. Yeah. Very exciting. All right. I mean, let's take this apart. I invited Chris because Chris had to be on the show. Huge part of this album, right? So, well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you got a little you know, playing the triangle in the background. <laughs> well, it's it, it's. Uh, I started to get rid of him about uh, you know five years ago. Um, what happened was we we did the trilogy. And it was our first big album together, our first big undertaking. And, I mean, it was impossible, really, but three albums, three years. And the third part, we did all of that, I think, was just me and Chris. And um, when we we still had some ideas, we, we had some bits and pieces left over, but we spent so much energy making those three albums, Three album, one each year, really, I mean, great quality in the songs that we, we just run out of energy, you know, creatively speaking. So I said to my manager, um, well, we need two years, really, before we can, before the energy comes back and you start getting creative and, and ideas just start appearing rather than just using technique. So um, so he managed to find that two years and we did bits and pieces over that time. And we had always scheduled our recording to be 2020. We were going to come back from South America, do a little bit of touring, then do some writing and then some festivals. And what happened was we, we did one of the last live gigs of any band, I think, in March at Burfest, I think it was, in London. Sold that show, absolutely fantastic. And then after that, gigs just went boop, 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 and they never came back. And um, we were already scheduled to start recording. So in one way, we had this crazy thing. We were really sad that all the shows had disappeared but each festival that disappeared gave us an extra three days to work on the album and what we did was we used that as kind of cooking time which is very important in the process the way that we write get together we did everything on um we started out using everything on this old green guitar. Mm. Um, acoustically. <laughs> we made that decision early on and Chris played, he, he worked out the riffs, the melodies, the solos, everything. On the green on guitar. guitar. Honestly, everything, you know. <laughs> and our, all our early demos were purely acoustic. And then we could take them away, give ourselves time, come back, having not listened to them, come back and then go, okay, now with a fresh ear, how do we feel? And it, it was great. It gave us that little bit of extra time to really find the arrangements, that the best thing. We're always looking for the best journey from the start to the end. How do we connect the lyric, the music and the emotion? How do we get those three things together and get them across? Uh, and sometimes we get a flash of inspiration. Sometimes it's a, a battle with each other. And sometimes <laughs> it's like, uh, you've seen that, have you seen the movie uh, Sharknado where the sharks come into it with a, sometimes it's like that. And we're grabbing a shark and trying to wrestle the 
the thing down. That's how the song feels. Feels impossible. You know. Well, I, I thought this was a fast song. No, it's a slow song. I thought it was a long song. No, it's a short song. And, oh man. So and, um, anyway, we April, had this April 9th. I want to throw it out there. April 9th. Hmm? Pre-order the album. April 9th. It's coming out. And I want to get Chris's opinion here too. Chris. Was the shark tank <laughs> describe the shark tank a little more? <laughs> Tell us your uh, input there. I know Blaze uh, got well, really, really dramatic there. Oh, uh, well, uh, yeah, there was a bit of tangling, and uh, it, <laughs> it's it does get challenging, you know, at times, but um, you know, that's that's just one of the things that we do when we're songwriting because we're always trying to get the best result. And uh, if one of us is thinking one way and one's thinking the other. I think the good thing that me and Blaze always do, that we always want to try everything with a song before we actually go, you know, yeah, all right, this is definitely the way we should we should go with it. So if, uh, if Blaze says, oh, let's try this quiet intro, and then I say, oh, let's try this in the instrumental or something with a different swing to the song, you know, we're always interested in trying to find the best thing so sometimes it's a battle and sometimes it comes you know fairly naturally so um it's the best type of music right i mean when yeah, you, yeah. and i think blaze nailed it you gotta you know cook it up you gotta cook well, it up sometimes right? it's like a, you know a, a part of the process which i have always found really valuable it's like the oven you know, you put something in the oven, you open the door too many times, it's never quite cooked, it's never quite finished. You put it in the oven, you leave it, you come back to it, and you see if it's good or not. And that's that's what we did quite a few times. And we were very lucky that we had that opportunity, that we were able to live with things. We had some ideas that we'd had for a couple, in the vault for a couple of years, a lot of brand new things and we knew at the beginning that it was a positive album and it was going to talk about heroes and it was gonna say look when you feel hopeless when you feel like you can't go on get this album out and remind yourself that you can, just simple messages. And, you know, as the lyrics ca came and different things happened, we just kept this thing in the mind, right, we're gonna be inside our fans' head. And when we have this privilege and honor that people are letting you into their room, into their life, into their head, what am I gonna say? when I'm there, because look what we're going through and look how difficult it is for all of us to adapt to this change in circumstances. And that's what we kept doing. And we just worked here in uh, our own small home studio. And I remember Chris just coming up with this one little bit. I said, oh, I fancy something with like a descending chord vibe and he started started going on it and bang it was pull yourself up and i was going to push it out and the chorus started working and then the lyrics came out and it was about two major episodes in my life first i had a terrible motorcycle accident just after i joined iron maiden and the physio said I don't think you will ever walk without a limp. And I thought to myself, you don't know me. <laughs> and uh, and I, man, I got off those crutches as soon as I could. I threw away that walking stick as soon as I could. And over the years, and it took a couple of years, I got the strength back in my leg and I never limped. And I was in pain a lot of the time, but I never I never limped. And another thing was, I remember a family member saying to me, you're never going to make it. You can't sing. What makes you think you can sing? 
And I remember a journalist writing, Blaze, you just can't sing. And that's like 30 years ago. <laughs> and there I am tonight, here I am. I own my own tiny record company. I've produced my own album and my wonderful fans support me and enable me to live my life as a professional full-time artist. So the second part of the song goes, come and sing with me. Because I, there's nothing special about me, but I had this help and this support. People kept me going, fans kept me going, and I was able to get a voice, find my voice, and get to the top job that any heavy metal singer could dream of, being the front man of Iron Maiden. Yeah. And just from that little thing that Chris did, it just went bop, 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 and all this came together, and that was it. And it's a fantastic song. Yeah. You know, it really it is, and it's got this repetitive chorus, and somewhat, somehow he's made it, he, he, he's made that chorus grow and it's not boring even though it repeats and it just it goes pull yourself up because those are the words the mantra that i had to use sometimes when i felt desperately alone to keep going pull yourself up come on pull yourself up get yourself up pick yourself up keep going come on don't listen to them to throw this to the reviewer alan alan you heard this album I've heard this I, album. I mean, Blaze describe just this took, album without the musicians. <laughs> Go. <laughs> I mean, Blaze just touched on on so many points there. I mean, for me, it's a much more positive album with the shorter songs of the, the trilogies and their albums before much more longer and much more introspective. I can say, but I mean, you know, uh, listen to this album. It's just wow, wow. Nice short songs get to the point and positive. I, I mean. I think Blaze, am I wrong, or you're in a better headspace? It seems like with this album than maybe in some of the That's prior ones. Well, I I wanted to do something very positive. I, I knew that I wanted to do a song that had heroes. I, I knew that I wanted to have some songs with heroes um, that perhaps you know people weren't so familiar with. So, three o three squadron were Polish and Czech pilots. The Nazis in World War II had already invaded their countries, tortured and murdered their families. And these men were able to make their way to Britain and join the RAF and fight against the Nazis again. And they had the highest uh, kill rate of any fighter squadron they were a vital part of the battle of britain unsung heroes i had to do something about them because that that what they did was incredible absolutely that's incredible just, and just to, to point out that's the song 303 and the first yeah. song was actually called pull yourself up chris musically speaking and alan always makes fun of me for this what is the musical direction like what is if you had to describe, if someone came up to you and said, what does this album sound like musically? Is it like Maiden? Is it like Blaze Bailey solo? Is it like, what is it like? Well, it's, it's a combination of everything that you've said. It, it is a very, you know, everything that we do do has that kind of Maiden influence, you know, and uh, has that kind of tag to it. Um, but... I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's an out and out sort of made and copycat um, when you're listening to it. Um, you know, if you say that I made and be because it's got harmony guitars and memorable riffs, then, you know, that's definitely in there. But I think uh, if you listen to the album, it's, it's got a lot more um, towards the heavier side of, of metal um, than Maiden. Um, and it does sound like, like a, a Blaze Bailey solo album, you know, because it's it's the fourth studio album I've worked with Blaze on, and um, it was a it was a great thing working on this album because we've written so many songs together now, um, even down to choosing what key the song is in, 
um, were able to, you know, gel. have you're yeah, gelling. We're, you're gelling over yeah. so many years. It's almost like we've got a go-to thing. So, oh yeah, let's let's have, let's put it in this key because this is a really comfortable thing. And then when we want the aggressive side of Blaze's voice, we can go to certain keys that we know work. And um, so, and we've got a lot of things in common. We're both big Dio fans, so um, you know that that rubs off with a, a lot of the sort of melodic parts. And when Blaze wants to do the more expressive side of his voice we know where to go and how to put it in um so it, you know a lot of the guessing work uh, had already kind of been eliminated because we had so much experience working with the trilogy um, you, you know i gotta say and i'm gonna as a reviewer here and alan is a reviewer and, and i think alan touched on it short to the point songs heavy this is like a heavy album and the production blaze and chris and alan to me, it's 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 three steps up from the last time. Am I right? Oh, or, thank you. Am I right here? Uh, yeah, it, Alan, it's a, a lot of it, it's a lot of work. What we what we did was we went back and listened to all of my solo albums uh, together. We just had a day in the studio. We listened to everything, right? Because the manager, my manager Mark, had said. Well, there's a couple of things that I like the sound of, and you know, I'm not telling you what to write, but I, I, these are the things I think that Blaze Bailey is, and that how a Blaze Bailey album sounds. And Chris and I listened through to that, our own particular favourites of songs from albums that I'd done, and started to get a vibe, you know, like you know, yeah, this part of the Blood and Belief album. When it does it, this is something that I'd really like to get involved with. And this part of Man Who Would Not Die, that, that feels good. And this part of Silica Messiah, you know, we haven't done anything like that for a while. And, you know, there's another place that that idea could go. And I think it was good. It gave us this common frame of reference and then as we were writing and we were looking for parts, we go, you know that bit on Silica Messiah where it does this? We need something like that here to do this. And that was a really good part of the process. But again, we were very lucky that we had time. You know, we felt relaxed. The other thing was this is a very different way that I've recorded albums. I've done demos like this, but we took a decision. We're going to record this at home. We're going to do the vocals at home in the home studio because we had great success with my acoustic album, December Wind, which Chris recorded. And, um, and of course, then there was no way to get together with the drummer. So we we're here and the whole thing came together right we need the drummer bits send him the bits get the bits in add them in later then we were lucky we could get the bass player to to come and play his parts and my part of the production i'm dominant in the arrangements and right where this where this riff should go with this and then Chris starts to take over with the details. Right, this this tiny bit here should go there, and then we go towards the mixing. So it's a we complement each other. It's a headache sometimes, and sometimes it's almost a fist fight. Ah. But we do complement each other <laughs> in our strengths, and and you know we give each other. I think probably Chris doesn't think I give him any space whatsoever. But I think we we do give each other that bit of latitude that he goes, some things he, he may not be convinced, and I'll go, no, this is how the song goes, and I'll go, all right, then. And then other things I'll say, and I'll go, no, this is how we achieve this sound. And, uh, and it's worked well. And a, another thing that we were able to do is we were able to find our drum sound very early on. 
And all the way through the process, we had the same kick and snare drum. We selected that, and as we were arranging it, we, we were going, yeah, this is, this is, these are the drums. We won't need to change these sounds or anything. And that really helped us because on the previous three albums, we hadn't got that opportunity. And uh, yeah. that really helped us on this one. Yeah. Alan? I'll just go, I'll go through the a few tracks. You guys can throw out your comments there. Uh, you know, War Within Me is a great track to start the album off with. Well, uh, you know what? That was one of the last ones we did. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it was one of the <laughs> last ones. It's uh, Chris had done a demo. He had the complete song, all the music, with the solo, everything, from start to finish. And, you know, it was one of the last ones. He said, well, I've got this idea. I said, well, leave it with me. And um, I'll, I'll just take my time with it. And I was looking at some of my notes that I use for my meditation. And I thought, bro, I thought that's a lyric to go with this song of Chris's. And it, it's a way that Ian Gillen works with Deep Purple that, and he did it with Black Sabbath as well. He'll have a finished song musically, then he'll take that away and find the lyric and the melody for it. And that's what I was able to do. It was quite a challenge because I hadn't done it for a while. But I, then I started to get the vibe of war within me and it, it started coming together lyrically and melodically, it was tough. And it was this self-destructive, negative, low, dark side against this positive, pick yourself up, responsible, kind, go ahead side. And, um, and that came out and I think it's a battle that many people have and have to get through is trying to get your better nature to be the dominant part of your personality instead of the negative, get blind drunk uh, and destroy your life side of it. Uh, and it was, it just came, it came great for me. I sent it to Chris a very rough demo that I did on my phone uh, uh, of the lyric. And he said, wow, these lyrics are really good. Um, so, uh, and it worked well. And gradually over time, I thought, no, this is it. This is, this is the name of the album. And it's the first song. It just has to be. So yeah, Chris did open. a great job. This was just, it, this was in Chris's own vault. I dragged it out and it just works so well. Good man. job, Chris. Good job. No, and again, I have, I'm having deja vu, uh, Blaze, because I think, you know, this is an ongoing theme with a lot of your albums. And you're saying the struggle between the negativity you have to overcome and remain positive. I mean, I, I think we had that conversation years ago when we met. Yeah, it, it is it's something. The, there are themes that I go back to. One is identity. Who are you? What makes you? What What... Are the things in your life, the things that you do that you identify with and that make your character and your personality? What makes you, you? And then the other one is the eternal struggle between light and dark. And many of my lyrics have featured an anti-suicide message to try and remind yourself that you have a choice. And... Part of Every Storm Ends, the last track on the album, that's a true story of my own emotional journey when my relationship uh, broke up and I had to come back from a tour to an empty home. And that was it. Uh, and that was tough, man. It was tough being on that tour and it was tough coming back. And Every Storm Ends is about that emotional journey. But I was lucky. I had support of incredible people and friends like Chris and I had wonderful fans that kept me going. 
and I was able to get through it. That was a storm. That was a horrible thing, but it did end. It seemed like it never would, but it did end. And Just so everybody I wanted knows, to, it's, it is yeah. a ballad like song, so everybody knows. It ends off, the album ends off with a nice, beautiful piece. And, uh, and Chris, that's my favorite solo on the album. You, you really touch into the emotion of that song with that solo. Hats off. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it, it 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 wasn't originally planned to be the last song on the album, um, and when we were deciding the track order, um, Bla Blaze made the suggestion, you know, let's put every storm ends, and to tie in with the ending of the album, um, because we just couldn't get it to fit anywhere else, you know, and it just seemed to be a natural end to the whole the whole thing, you know, as one piece of music if you're listening from start to finish you know the 10 tracks um so yeah it, it's it's a perfect place for it you know alan for me when i see the power of nikola tesla <laughs> a blaze i mean it's like he's a depressed man wasn't he depressed and poor and broke when he died no <laughs> no no he wasn't no he wasn't no, like i wasn't. know the whole story i know uh, there's a lot of ac you know, there do you know how he died how did he die he was run over by a taxi cab in New York City. Jeez. Uh, yeah, he was run over and he never recovered from his injuries. That's how he died. He was in his 80s. But didn't and he, he was have... still as bright as he ever was. So I, I knew I had these three scientists that I had to write about because uh, of the things that they'd achieved and, and perhaps things that they weren't so known for. And Nikola Tesla, he wanted to give the world, everybody, free electricity. Oh, yes, I remember that. Yeah, yes. uh, yes. of course. So that is the real story of Nikola Tesla. It is that, of course, no one is going to allow that to happen in the capitalist Western world. You can't have free electricity. What will they do? You know, we, how can we get... We'll, we won't be able to get them to go to work. You know, how can we enslave them if we give them free power? What, what, why would they go to work? So that was the real story. And there's a bit of telepathy in his story as well, in that when he was a child, he had a dream of a water wheel and Niagara Falls. Oh, yes. Then yes. years later, he designed and built the first hydroelectric power plant. Yes. Uh, and nobody knew if it would work because he refused to tell any of the other people <laughs> on the project the whole thing. They knew that. They knew that. And I think it was Westerhouse was the boss, I think. Correct, please correct me if I'm wrong. He, he said, um, how does it work? Uh, uh, and he said, he said to the guys, will it work? And they said, we don't know. Nicola <laughs> didn't tell us how it works. And Nicola, he, Nicola Tesla himself turned the switches and then the electricity came out. It had never been done before. Yeah. And Thomas and so, Edison's out the he's banging on the door trying to get in. Thomas Edison's banging on the door. Let well, me in. Wasn't Thomas Edison contract. his boss? Didn't he work yeah. with Thomas Edison? Yeah, he did. In the early he's one of his first things was when he went there to the USA. Uh he had a, a great recommendation letter. And he he worked for Thomas Edison for a while, and then they they parted ways and they could never agree edison was entrenched in this dc production of electricity which meant you had to have local stations transmitting it whereas tesla had found a way to step up and down the power so you could have one big central power station and you could transmit that power for miles and miles without the need for these little power stations so that was the real crux, I think, of uh, their disagreements. Ed Edison and, and Tesla remind me you and you of you and Chris, you know. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a little bit of headbutting happened in there. Well, <laughs> so anyway. that's it. I, I had to do Nikola Tesla, and then 
uh, Alan Turing. Yes. Um, Light bulb. No. I, I had to. Well, Alan computers, Turing, artificial God, intelligence. He's the, uh, the godfather machines. of modern computing, and he. There is an argument to say to say that because he invented that computer and cracked the Enigma code, that. World War II was much shorter because of his contribution and what he invented. And I, I wanted to celebrate. Yeah. Alan, I, I wanted to celebrate him because he dreamed. He was another person who dreamed. It was an actual dream. He dreamed of this artificial intelligence. And now here we are. Here we are yeah. with... Uh, Siri listening to every <laughs> single word and recording it and giving you us know, ads. I, I can't, yeah, I can't have one of those speakers in my house because I would just swear at it. I'd be, I'd be like, God, just, I'm such a bully. I'm so evil. I would just be swearing at that, you know. Big I'd data, my friend. The yeah, unstoppable Stephen Hawking. I mean, well, there's a genius. There's another genius right there. Well. This song is about the man. I wanted to celebrate the man. Fantastic, a genius, discoveries, supermassive black holes, Hawking radiation, lots and lots of big scientific discoveries. But for me, the most important part, the most important story is the doctor said to Stephen Hawking, you have motor neuron disease and you you have about three years to live. 49 years later, <laughs> Stephen Hawking is on a world tour doing lectures and he can't even speak. He doesn't have a voice, but he's, he's so he's achieved the impossible. He did not accept this sentence that death sentence that the doctor gave him he refused it and he just carried on regardless he had too much to do too much to live for and there he was this frail wrecked twisted frame with this incredible brain i don't think i would have survived that but for me that is the thing i really wanted to celebrate and when we came up with the chorus and uh, uh, Chris and I just looked at each other and go, wow, you know, where that, where did that come from? Maybe Stephen Hawking's looking down on us and he sent that to us, you know, because it, it, we I just would got say, so Chris, good. Sorry to cut you off, please. I would say, Chris, on that song, that is the maiden song of the album. Yeah, I think you're right. The, uh, Alan, the, that, you say, that is the Maiden song. I wouldn't say the rest of the album is like Maiden-ish, but this is definitely the Maiden. The the main parts of the uh, of the music to uh, Unstoppable Stephen Hawking, I think that's been in, in the bank the longest. It's, it's yeah. been the longest on the whole thing because I remember on the first tour I did with Blaze, um, or it might have been the anniversary tour of Silicon Messiah we did in 2015. And we were doing a lot of the writing sessions um, for the trilogy uh, at any spare hour we got in a hotel or a day off. And uh, the core roots and the main riffs for um, Unstoppable Stephen Hawking were from all those years ago. And uh, we, we just never quite got, got the song or found the lyrics and the, the melodies to fit it into the trilogy, you know, because it all had to fit it correctly in the story. And uh, I think we just pulled it pulled it out of the bag in these writing sessions and we said, oh, what what about this? And then Blaze had the idea, um, the hawk, and that became un Unstoppable Stephen Hawking. Well, originally it was never meant to be this, you know, massive epic song. It just kind of <laughs> developed into this massive thing that, and it's like, oh, let's put another solo here. Let's do a midsection. And, um, and you're, and you're probably saying yourself, Stephen Hawking, what does he have to do with metal, Blaze? What does he have to do with metal? <laughs> well, the strength it's within. Theme. It's been a common theme in my writing, oh, yes. you know, way back, you know, even to the Wolfsbane days. 
and you know with future real in maiden there you know there's quite a few things silicon messiah has a strong science fiction theme that i have the 10th dimension which is a, a an concept album about a scientist so i have this i did uh song about galileo as well I, I have this interest in science and I, I think it's one of the the good things about metal you know we don't always have to be fantasy Agreed. Agreed. we don't always have to be christian or satanist so you know we can do anything that we want really and um well i think that's what my fans enjoy and Chris and I, we both like Queen. And one of the things that we like about it is there isn't a particular Queen style of song. There, the, the style of Queen is a great song that makes sense musically and lyrically. Yeah. It's not in, right, not every Queen song feels like another version of Bohemian Rhapsody or Seven Seas of Rye, you know, when you've got crazy little thing called love and fat bottom girls, mm. but they're all great songs and they all have their place. Yeah. And I think for us, the most important thing before we worry about any kind of detail, does the song work? Have we got the melodies we need to take the listener on the journey so that as we introduce the vocal, the listener is drawn to the vocal. And then as we introduce the instrumental, the listener is taken on the journey in the instrumental. It's not just right now it's time for the solo and back to the verse. We never do that. If that's appropriate, we do it, but it rarely happens. It's right, where do we go after this? How do we get to that part? Where do we go with this? And I think on this album, we've got just some magnificent solos from Chris. I mean, it just great. And um, I, I think 18 days, 18 flights. That's um, a Saxon I, vibe. I got a Saxon vibe coming yeah, out of that. Yeah, and that, that's because it's a true story. About, it is, okay. I was going to ask yeah, you it, that. It's an absolute true story. <laughs> um, we were in Chile and the guys down there, um, ha had a festival and called it Blaze Fest. Had the local bands, big indoor gig, fantastic lighting, wonderful stage, great sound system. Everything is going really, really well. And in the middle of the fifth song, Escape Velocity, we have this breakdown where it starts chugging, duh, 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 and uh, and the fans started running away. Oh, well, it's not, that's not good. And then the lights went out <laughs> and then the electric went off, the power went off uh, and the, the uh, promoter organizer came over and said, Blaze, it's an earthquake, we've got to leave the building. And I said, wow. And there's Martin McNee, and this is in the song, going like this. <laughs> it's still going, it's still going through. I on it, like, I, I'm still going, I'm going, Martin, stop, it's an earthquake. <laughs> and then the uh, message came on the phone. I mean, this is one of the scariest messages, disconcerting that I've ever had. Uh, tsunami warning, oh, go yeah. to higher ground. Yeah, exactly. And there, and there, you're 50 meters from the ocean. Oh, jeez. Right? So, you know, so it's like, wow, this is a, it, it could be, a, oh, man. So we had to get up to uh, some higher grounds. Five well, it came out a great in, song, right? I mean, five you know, songs yeah, in are back to the higher ground. The, the guy, um, the guy, <laughs> the, the promoter, Omar, I think his name is, uh, we came down and there's bits of building in the street and all of this. And uh, our, and he said, wow. He said, do you think you'd write a song? You're going to write a song about this? And I thought, you know what? It would, this would be. So that was on the list then. It's like, oh, we've got to write a song about that. You know, when you think there of you Deep go. Purple and Smoke on the Water, exactly. we've got to write a song 
about that. Bedlam and, in uh, Belgium. Bedlam right. in yeah, Belgium, yeah, ACDC. Yeah, you and, know, and it's the same long, thing. Saxon, long arm of the law. You know, the, there's a great history <laughs> of so uh, a tradition yeah. in, in what we, in rock and metal, of these story songs about, you know, some event that happened when you were on the road. And I said to Chris, how many flights was it? And he said, it was 18 flights in 15 days. Crazy. And I thought, that's the lyric. That's the lyric. <laughs> and, uh, and we built the song around that. Just, just everybody, Mark, I'm going to tell you all the people from around, all around the world that are watching, okay? You got Marco in Italy, Sandra in Switzerland, uh, Josh in the UK, in Maine, you have Manchester, UK, you have Lancashire, you have Montreal, Canada, you have the UK, uh, Germany, Newfoundland in Canada, Ohio, Scotland, France, more Canada, more Italy. Uh, and I mean, and, and I guess my, my question is, is you've become a global force to be reckoned with. This is not just the UK. A global tsunami. A global tsunami. <laughs> it's incredible that you've, you've, with all your struggles, you've, you've broken globally. I mean, I guess that's your touring, right? Right, Blaze. Well, that's... I'm very lucky. I'm very, very lucky. I have wonderful, loyal fans that have stayed with me for years through thick and thin. They've bought every album come to every tour and sometimes I haven't been you know that good hand on heart and people have stuck with me and they've made it possible for me to continue so I'm very very lucky and we have tried to tour with every single thing that we've done you know um so we we've kept going but the main thing is I'm just lucky to have the support of these wonderful people that make it possible for me to live my dream and live as a professional heavy metal singer, a songwriter, and make the album that I want to make. And no compromise about artwork, the music, anything. The only person that has any say in the music is Chris. We work it out together. As he, you know, in the shark that's tank. it. Yeah, uh, 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 that's it. So I'm very, very lucky. You know, Blaze, such incredible support. First time me and Alan interviewed you was the king of metal. Yeah, that's how long it's been, and that was a long time ago. Now, what is that? Fifteen yeah, years. Is. Yeah, gotta be. Maybe gotta like be. twelve years, somewhere around there. I mean, yeah. wow, it, it's. Well, I just like to add to that, Jim. One of the things that Blaze told us at the time is, and Paul Diano told him, he says, "There's no way you can ever have your own band to tour anymore." And now, look with uh, Absolver, that's exactly what you're doing. Well, Chris is his own band. You know, he makes his own albums with Absolver. They're a wonderful band. They make great music. It. They have a particular sound that is British heavy metal and they do their own thing. So it's not my band. If I don't do anything, those guys are on the road themselves. They're making albums. They're going on tour, doing their own thing. They're a great band in their own right. So what's good for me is I'm able to Get those guys that go, right, come and do my stuff with me. And we've developed a really great working relationship. And then they can go and do their thing that they do. Well, you know, those Absolver albums are really good. And Chris produces those. Yep. They sound great. Yep. Luke is on there, Luke Appleton. He, he's also been playing with Oyster as well. So... They're, they are they're really great albums, and many of my fans have uh, also become Absolver fans as well. So speak to us about Absolva. <laughs> Absolva, sorry, Chris. You know uh, we, we don't want to leave you guys out, and and you know you do so much for Blaze. You know backing him up, then doing your own tour. So what's going on there, just quickly? Yeah, well we we've been busy as well. We um, we released a new album last year um and it was it was already planned and we released it during the lockdown 
and then uh, th through uh, through 2020, we released a new live album, Live in Europe, which was really cool because uh, I managed to find a lot of concerts from Absolver gigs over the past few years and managed to make a live album um, with a lot of different gigs from different countries. So it was quite similar to um, ACDC, if you want blood. So it was, you know, each gig each track on the album was from a different concert. So the live album got a lot of uh, good response and it was great because obviously with uh, the restrictions with COVID, we couldn't really get together and write songs. There's a lot of work happening remotely. So I could mix the live album because it's all, it's all recorded, it's all there. So it was a great, great thing to put together. Very, very exciting. And uh, we've just started writing a new album, a yeah. new studio album. Um, so um, we've got uh, we've got the first early ideas for that that myself and Luke are working on, and we hope to get that ready for later on in 2021. Mm, good news. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I gotta say, you guys do a phenomenal job, Blaze, like always. Um, and and when I look and I listen to this album, and I had the pleasure of listening to the promo. I was really impressed. And, and you know, like, I, I love all the Blaze albums, I'll be honest, right? I, I don't think there's an album I don't like, but I, this is one of the taste. better ones of the ones yeah. that I like. How's that? You have great taste. <laughs> <laughs> and when I wear your shirt, I'm better looking. You feel, you feel better. <laughs> That's why I wore the shirt. Yeah. <laughs> but again, if we if we could just, uh, you know, I just want to reiterate the positive messages. I mean, for me, the unstoppable Stephen Hawking, that's just using his character to talk about the strength within. Oh, you can decide how to live, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Warrior, the courage to rise up again, right? Yeah. Pull yourself up. Hey, uh, by the way, is life preordained, uh, Blaze? Life is not. It, my philosophy, in my philosophy, your future is in your own hands. Life is not preordained. That's why I, I was so happy when I found that lyric and I got that word to fit that preordained word. It's not preordained. That's what they tell you. That's what people want you to believe. In my philosophy, your future is in your own hand. And uh, whatever journey that you're going on, it's a series of small steps, small decisions, little decisions that you make and taking responsibility for the things that you do, not abdicating your own personal responsibility for yourself and society, then this is what's important. For me, the future is in your own hand and it's like a ripple on a pond. Your idea, your dream is a rock a stone that you throw into the lake and you see the ripples go, right? And you've started, that's it. And then you follow and you you ride those ripples and you keep going. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's the future. It's, it's in your own hand. That doesn't suit everybody. Some people want destiny. They want things written, um, but no, not for me. It's you start from the shore, you look across the lake and you go, well, there must be a way to get there. Yeah. You, you know, I've always wanted, and I think we probably talked about this like 20 times, that blaze opening up for Maiden, that tour. I mean, that would be the, I think every Maiden fan would agree with this. Right, Chris? <laughs> Every Maiden fan would agree with this. You blaze. How can we It'd make this happen? What, who do we have to call here? I mean, who do we have to call? I don't know, but it would be a lot of fun. And, you know, obviously I, I've been in the band, so I know that they really do have good catering. Okay. Uh, so we'd be well fed on That's... that. We'd be well fed on that tour, and we struggle to eat healthy. Proper. Uh, uh, on our tours normally so that would be one advantage certainly i would love to see the guys you know i spoke to steve a couple of months ago um about what he's doing you know and how we're coping with covid and everything 
So it would be a really fun thing to do. But, uh, you know, I think uh, the food would be a big attraction. <laughs> that would be the incentive. You get a yeah, good writer. Healthy food. Healthy food. Let, every, let me just see if there's... every day. Let me just see if there's... All right. Somebody's got a... I want a cool question. Something we never thought of asking. And just throw it out there. If somebody's out there who wants to throw out a great question, I'm all ears and I'll ask it as long as, of course, it's appropriate. Uh, in the meantime, live streams. I mean, is this an option for the Blaze Bailey ba uh, live streaming, doing a show as you're waiting well, to play the live here's, a, here's the problem. It's, we don't live together. So we live in different places, in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult for us to get together. At the moment, there are restrictions on where you can go and what you can do. It's We're in a lockdown situation. In the early days in Wolf Spain, we all lived in the same house. So, so we could do it. Good. And, you know, when, when I did um, Manor Would Not Die, we were living in the same house. When I did um, Promise and Terror, we're all in the same house. When Chris and I got together, I think we had the guys staying here and then going into the studio, I think for most of uh, Entanglement and Endurance Survive, we we were all here together for a while recording. But when we're not recording and we're not touring, we're not together. I think that's how we actually survive and we haven't killed each other. <laughs> <laughs> because when we do get together, we've got something to talk about. So... Um, yeah, so it, it's it's more difficult for us to do a live stream because we just we don't live together. We're not all local, so there's some traveling involved, and I'm very aware, you know, of the rules and why they are there. So you know, we were very careful on this album. We got a long distance between us. We spent 15 day sections together in our writing and recording. So we were in quarantine, kind of self-imposed quarantine together. <laughs> right, we'll do this. Then we'll do, you know, we'd spend 15 days away from each other and all of that. So so we were careful um, doing that. And we when we had, we were lucky enough to get Carl here to do his base. We were distanced, safe distance. We had different chairs, different uh, things to eat from as well. So, you know, we were careful during the whole thing. Martin did his stuff remotely. We sent him, said, right, we want something like this, make it human, make it you, and he would send it back. And then Chris would stick it in the recording. You know, the album is possible because of the technology and the advances that have been made and because of broadband, um, then that's how the album was possible. But for a streaming thing, it would mean that we would all have to get on the Zoom together and then we'd all be in separate places and so would the audience. We're part of the magic is being in the same room. Oh. All right. Here's some quick questions before we end. Favorite, favorite Iron Maiden song to play live? Um, I think it's got to be Virus. Chris? You know, I, I like uh, them all. For me, Judgment of Heaven is a is a big one. Yeah, you that's know. big, isn't it? You know, it's it, it comes from nowhere, starts different, and then it's off into this big chorus and big instrumental, and uh, yeah, that's one of my favourites. Alan, what's up? The Klansman. Your I, I've never Your performed favorite. with Blaze, so I don't know which one. <laughs> okay. Here, the book. Will the book ever be released on the trilogy? Oh, good question. Good question. Well, <laughs> all right. I mean, uh, that's a bad question. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a big whiteboard. You know, it's the same size that you'd find in a classroom at uh, at a high school or something. So I've got a really big whiteboard. Chris and I put it up and we mapped out the album on it. And now the book is mapped out on it. And it, each chapter has its own small piece of paper oh, wow. with what roughly what should be in it. 
there are 34 songs on the Infinite Entanglement trilogy. Um, and so there are 34 pieces of paper up there on the whiteboard. And so far, three of those have actually been finished and gone into the book. So it leaves me 31 <laughs> to do. Okay, good. And uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, I, I am solid on it now um, in between these days. But it's a lot of work, man. I yeah. had the, five years ago. I started writing it. Five years ago, I started writing it, and then I used the ideas and the words for lyrics, and that turned into the albums and everything. And then the story developed on the albums, and then now there's more story on the albums than I had written, and it's oh, it's a massive job, man. <laughs> massive. I feel. Like I'm writing Game of Thrones, <laughs> you know. So that's it for me, you know. But like this is my typing, or even this. <laughs> oh, get this one in. But I, I learned this this special thing where you get your thumb for the space bar. That's increased my speed <laughs> by about one word an hour. One word an hour. How about yeah? How about so? Okay. But, but yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working on the book. I'm full time on it. I've got about 70 pages that I think are really good. I've got another chunk of stuff that has to be sorted out, put in, and then it, it's very much the same creative process that we use for an album, but it's like writing 10 albums at once. Ugh. So uh, that that's the that's the thing. It's um, it's get it out, get the rough idea out there, go back, polish it, leave it, come back to it later. How does it feel now? Oh yeah, this bit needs polishing. Do the next bit. Come back. So it's like oh, that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Here's another question from Messiah of Pigs. <laughs> What was it like performing with Paul Diano? We've interviewed Paul Diano many times. Oh, it's, it's such a laugh. I mean, it's so much fun. Yeah, We've had so many great times together. It's been it's been so much fun touring with Paul over the years. You know, and that was part of my comeback was when uh, we did all of these shows with Paul and did I did a lot of touring with Paul in Russia. So and different uh, festivals and different things around Europe. It, it, what a what a great laugh. What a great personality. Would you would you consider like going again on, on doing a small little tour with Paul again when he gets I, better? I just don't you... have the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my manager, it, it, it just, it's one thing after another. Oh, do an album, write a book, you know, and then uh, been in touch with the Wolfsbane guys and we want to make another album together as well. So in between writing the book, I've got to try and write the Wolfsbane lyrics and get some songs together, you know. And Jace Edward sent me some great music through from him and Jeff. So, you know, we're busy, really, man. I don't have time to go on tour. No. <laughs> really. Marco's saying, are you still in contact with Steve Harris? Okay, you already answered that. And would you consider him playing maybe as a guest on an album? I guess if Steve wanted to, or vice yeah, 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 definitely. It, it's just le the toughest thing about that is the logistics. Okay, it's it, it's Chris and I having a song and saying, right, we've got this. Let's send that to Steve and ask him to come up with a bass part for it. It's just the, the logistics, you know, where is Steve at that time? Has he got time to do it? Is he on the road with Maiden or with White Lion? You know, you know with um, British, Lion. British, British Lion. Lion. So it, it's just a logistical, it's just a logistical thing, really. All right. So on that note, Chris, you want to tell us what, if you buy the album, if you pre-order the album today, what different versions are there and... What can you expect? Do you get your name on it? Do you get a shirt? Like, what are the different bundles? Maybe you can just give a quick summary of that. Yeah, there's lo lots of different options. And great thing about this pre-order is we're doing the CD and the vinyl 
from and the, the vinyl <laughs> and the vinyl <laughs> and the, the artwork looks great and there's all sorts of different options and um there's the premium packages up at the moment um i think some of the options are actually running out because it's sold really well uh, with the pre-order already so if anybody does want to pre-order it and uh, you want some of the deluxe options uh, get in there quick on blazebailey.co.uk or blazebailey.net um so yeah, but it's it's looking great. The artwork is looking yes, really yes. I fantastic. I can actually put that yeah, up yeah, for everybody yeah. as we speak. If I can get to it here, the artwork's beautiful. Who who did that? Uh, Aki, who, who did the uh, the last one as well, and uh, I I sent him the the rough demos that we had, and told him the song titles and uh, and what they were about, and I said I, I really want to see the elements he uh, of the songs i see the he black did, hole there's a black hole right? yeah there's he a black did hole. december wind for me and he got oh, every song he got a little illustration about it on the cover i said i wanted it here so stephen hawking his yeah. chair is disappearing into a black hole yes and there is a little tiny nikola tesla with some lightning and then there is the Enigma words as well. And there's some hurricanes flying across because that's the 303 squadron. So it's good. It, and the, of course, like the main it. illustration is the giant, a magnificent Blaze head. Yes. With two Blazes fighting inside for to own the mind of blaze yeah. and that's the war within so he's done a fantastic job there fantastic yeah, no, it's beautiful and that's pretty much it guys uh, unless alan you have something else you want to add no i again uh, you know positive messages uh, great guitar solos great production like you said jim and uh just a pleasure to listen to congratulations guys it's really thank something. you very much man yeah. thank you it's you know you're, you're there and you hope that people will understand it. You think you have the vibe. We look at each other and go, yeah, I, I think it's good, but you never know until you let it out. And I would just say to you guys, please tell everybody about the new album, War Within Me. And if you hate it, please lie about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good sales technique. <laughs> <laughs> buy it regardless purchase yeah, it regardless yeah. actually the only i got way one you last can make an informed decision is by purchasing it and then deciding for yourself yeah this, this is a way to end it okay and i think it's a good way to end it and matthew says does it bother you to be more known as the ex-singer of iron maiden rather than just blaze bailey well that depends who you talk to yeah it really depends it really depends who you talk to you know being in maiden it was the top job in the world that a heavy metal singer could have. Yeah. And I had it. And I wrote songs, had top 10 hits, did huge concerts. And I have a lot of fans from the Iron Maiden days. But it's five years out of a career of 35 years. It's two albums out of a career of 20 albums. Crazy. I have 11 solo album studio and uh, I think it's three or four live albums. So it's, it's important, but it, it's not the whole story of Blaze Bailey. And there are, you know, there are fans that like Blaze Bailey and Maiden is their second band. Yeah. So for me, it's a wonderful time. It's a great thing that Maiden is so known and I'm associated with something and I'm very proud of the work that we did. And if somebody comes and investigates and finds out about Blaze Bailey because they listen to Iron Maiden, that's great. There's still a few fans there of Maiden that hate me 
So I'm doing something right. <laughs> All right, guys. The, the hardest working man in metal, Blaze Bailey, and a new Absolver album coming out in 2021 for Chris. Congratulations and looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Cheers. And hey guys, this was fun, and we'll see you when you come to Canada. All right? Yeah. Cheers, guys. Stay, stay safe. Well. Okay, stay stay well. safe, everybody. Have yourself a good night.